So yesterday, I talked uh, mostly about quasi-periodic solutions. So as I promised in the first lecture, today I will instead study the diffusive solutions. So the solutions which undergo uh, sub uh, growth of Sobolev norms, except that I have to find my notes. So again, let me remind you of the problem. I just to PU on T2. And so the problem in itself was that I want to find a solution and the time, which should be a large time, such that the initial datum in HS norm, so here I'm taking S larger than 1 for my result, is uh, very small. And instead, the end datum at this time capital T is very large. And so my statement is that for all delta small and k large, I can play this game. OK? So this is the question today. So the whole point of the first lecture was to say, as also Professor Posadé pointed out, that instead of studying this system, you can study the Birkhoff system. OK, and so let me write the Birkhoff system. I had a, a compact way of writing it, which I prefer, so I will keep it. So I had the resonant Birkhoff Hamiltonian, which is the sum over the J, the two p plus tuples, which are resonant, of the monomial j. And of course, I have to define all of this. So this vector j is j1 up to j2p plus 2, h z2. And the monomial is u j1, u bar j2 and so on, up to u bar j2p plus 2, as before. And the resonances, so a list is a resonance if the sum of the indexes is 0, and the sum of the squares of the indexes is 0. OK, so being in a resonance is uh, three relations, because these are two relations. This is a scalar relation on the 2p plus 2 plus. OK, and then this is the resonant Hamiltonian, meaning that you can find a change of variables such that the NLS equation in these new variables is just the quadratic piece, which gives me the linear dynamics plus the resonant Hamiltonian, plus a term of degree for p plus 2. OK? So my argument, as it was for the quasi-periodic solutions, my argument will be that I want to prove solutions of this type for this Birkhoff Hamiltonian here. And since uh, the resonant part is defined by the fact that it Poisson commutes, with the term of uh, degree 2, then I just can study HRS. And then the point will be that since uh, the solutions uh, I am finding are finite time solutions, uh, then provided I'm sufficiently close to 0, let's say in L1 norm, which is fine, it's a small L1 norm, then uh, I can claim that the solutions, that th this piece here is negligible with respect to the solutions. Okay. In the case of yesterday, it was more complicated because it was not a finite time solution, so I really had to do a KM theorem. But here the argument is uh, uh, relatively standard, and I think I will not do it. I will concentrate instead on proving the existence of this diffusive solution for the resonant term. Okay, but uh, let me remind you that this result for the case of the cubic NLS was proved by the I team. And then there is a result which uh, gives also some estimates on the time of uh, uh, this capital T uh, by Kalashin and Guardia. Okay? 
And uh, in fact, the time that we get, we, we also get a, a time estimate for uh, any NLS, but the time estimate ex is extremely bad. Is like some power, k okay, to the delta to some other power here. This is a large number. So this is an ugly estimate. It's a very long time. Okay, but uh, it's very hard to get better estimates on the time, and it becomes uh, uh, also the, the argument uh, to get better estimates on the time, uh, um, which Kaleshin and Guardia did, uh, is pretty specific for the NLS, and we're not really able to just push it to our case. And in fact, they got polynomial estimates on the time also, but in that case, they required that only uh, the L2 norm of the initial solution was small. And then this simplifies somewhat the problem because you're less close to zero, obviously, in your it's quite clear that here the problem of diffusion becomes harder and harder the more you are close to zero in your initial datum. If you're far away from zero enough, uh, then uh, there were also previous results by Cookson that showed that you had diffusion, but for very large data. So yes, uh, is a, a bit of the question. But and at this point, uh, I will uh, for some time just go back to my, uh, once I have settled this notation and said these things, I will uh, uh, go back to my notations of the resonances. Because of course, uh, the reason why I, I got interested in this problem is because you can really use uh, all uh, the machinery that we put up on resonance sets uh, and genericity conditions to this case. And, uh, and then it, this helps you to deal with the non-cubic NLS where you do not have a geometric picture of the resonances. Ah, let me remind you a last thing, which I forgot. I hope it fits here. I'll try to make it fit here. A trivial resonance is a list, okay, J such that the J, the odd indexes up to J two P plus one coincide with the even indexes J four J two P plus two. Okay, and this occur for any uh, dispersion though, and it's oh, and uh, I, I have to consider them as special. So I got lost. What was I saying? So how uh, does this connect? Well, it's pretty clear what I want. So what did I prove last time? Let me write it here. I fixed some set S, which was composed of n points, which I called V1, Vn, all of them in Z2, obviously. And then I said that there exists a polynomial, and uh, V1, Vn. And this polynomial was pretty explicit. It was something like this. What is this mean? Vi squared, and this is the sum. This is a finite product, and these lambdas are in Zn. Their sum is one, and uh, the sum of the moduli is smaller than 2p plus 1. And I'm missing something else. The support is not 1. OK, so I had an explicit polynomial. And I, I wanted to write it down because I'm really going to use this. And then uh, if uh, p computed on the vi's is different from 0, then uh, I had an invariant subset supported on s. It took me. So you remember, well, maybe I'll write it down. This subset is invariant. And also, the second point, which I have to write here, and very important, is that if you restrict to US, then here I just have the trivial resonances. So this says that the dynamics on HRS is trivial and it's on Torai, and surely I cannot have any behavior of this type. And uh, also, you have to remember, this is a very strong condition. So if you, uh, 
it's a very strong constraint, sorry. So if you choose uh, n points in Z2 uh, in a random way, then you surely will get them in such a way that this polynomial is not zero. I mean, you almost surely will get them in such a way that this polynomial is not zero. So you can ask yourself, OK, can I instead uh, work on the zero set of this polynomial and say something on when the vi's are on the zero set of this polynomial? For instance, could I decide that I want to fix one resonance relation? You see, that polynomial there is written as product of irreducibles, which are the single terms. Okay? And each single term is one resonance condition for me. Okay? It says that the VI satisfy one particular resonance condition. So you can ask yourself, can I make it so if you want to look at the zero set of this polynomial in the space uh, here, so P of V equal to zero, so the VIs, I think of them, uh, so let, let me try to explain. I can think of this as a polynomial inside of C2 to the n, okay? And then I have the zero set, which is decomposed uh, in the zero sets of the single resonances, okay? And so I can wonder, can I ask that I am on the zero set of one resonance and not on the zero set of all the other resonances? Of course I can, because they are separate. Reducible polynomials, either they coincide or they are uh, transverse. But unfortunately, if I just ask this, I'm not really happy because if I just ask this, then uh, I cannot impose uh, that this space uh, is uh, invariant. In uh, the cubic case, remember that a single resonance relation is uh, a right angle between three points. And obviously, if I impose that only one right angle holds, then this point here cannot be an S. And then you have uh, a resonance made out of three points in S and one outside. And yesterday I proved to you that if you have a situation of this type, then the system US is not invariant. Okay? So I really have to require uh, VR. And the best thing that I can hope is three independent relations. Once I have these three angles that are right angles, then this is a right angle as well, okay? And this is perfectly reasonable because if you look at one single resonance, one single resonance uh, is three relations, so you should get at least a co-dimension three manifold in your condition. So at this point, this becomes a reasonable question to ask. My reasonable question is, uh, can I choose S so that US is invariant? Let's say I, I have only in the sense there, say. What I mean here is, uh, let's say I have that v1 squared minus v2 squared plus v4 squared, v3 squared minus v4 squared is zero, same for the vi's. But no other resonance occurs, okay? So the only right angles that I can make with three points inside here are the ones drawn in that picture. Well, this is obviously possible because, uh, let's see, you have to, so this is V1, V2, V3, V4. I have to add the point V5 in such a way that no right angles form here. Well, clearly it's quite easy to do that. And also, if you think about it in the context uh, of uh, saying that you're working on the zero set of that manifold, you can say that I have 
the co-dimension three manifold, let me call it M, saying that this resonance holds. And when I add a new point, this is a new variable, which has nothing to do with V1, V2, V3, V4. And so obviously, the condition that uh, the th three points form a right angle is, cannot be on this manifold. It has to be transverse to this manifold because I have an extra variable, so there's nothing more to say. Okay. Well, then I can become more ambitious and say, let's suppose that I want to prescribe a certain number of prefixed resonances. Can I just choose any set of prefixed resonances and ask that these and only these occur? Well, here I can start with the cubic case and I will show you that you need at least some condition. It's not really true that you can do this because if I fix v1, v2, v3, and v4, which form a rectangle. And then I need the colored chalks, like this. And then say I produce v5 and v6, which form a rectangle with v3. Oops. <laughs> Okay, I have produced this new rectangle, but then obviously I cannot ask that only these two rectangle resonances occur because I have an extra rectangle joining V1, V2, V5, and V6. It's quite obvious, right? And uh, in the same way, I could say here, if I add another couple of points on this circle, then again, I have more than two rectangles. I automatically have three rectangles, okay? Because some right angles are prescribed. And this, how, how, so this is perfectly clear in the case P equal one. If you try to give reasonings in uh, more general cases and it starts to, you, you need to start to be able to do some bookkeeping. But what is the point here? The point is that clearly if you take two resonance relations, so V1 squared, I'll, I'll just write the squared ones, okay? Because uh, it's V3 squared minus V4 squared is equal to zero. And then I take V4 squared minus V3 squared plus V5 squared minus V6 squared equal to zero. And if I sum them up, I still get a resonance, okay? And naturally, since here I have uh, the same two points appearing here and here, then I get a resonance, which is a rectangle resonance. But in general, you can, uh, uh, it's quite obvious that if you have two resonances, so suppose you have uh, that J, so let's see if I can, so if I have a, a resonance, J1, J2P plus 2, now I have to write it down in a better way. In this way, you'll never understand. I have to give you some notation. So in the resonances, exactly as we did for the resonance polynomial, instead of writing it with the Ji's, which might be repeating the same uh, uh, value of Vi many times, I want to write a resonance living on S as uh, sum mu i vi equal to zero and sum mu i vi squared equal to zero with uh, mu smaller than 2p plus 2 and the sum of the mu i's equal to zero. Okay, this is just rewriting the resonance in a more nice way. And then it's obvious uh, that if mu1 is a resonance and mu2 is a resonance, then mu1 plus mu2 is a resonance in the sense that it satisfies these two equations. 
you just uh, they're linear in the mu's so you can sum them up in any way what might happen is uh, it might not be true that the modulus of mu1 plus mu2 is smaller than 2p plus 2 And in this case, this is still a resonance, but it is not a resonance for the NLS of degree p. Okay? So go back to the cubic example. I do not want this because I have one resonance here, one resonance here, and the sum of the two resonances is still a resonance for the cubic NLS. But if uh, I took instead of something like this, so let me see, I have instead of this situation here, I, I have to, I erase this resonance here and then I add another resonance with just one point in common with the first resonance, so V5, V6, V7. Well, then it's still true that the sum of two resonances is a resonance, but it will be irrelevant for the cubic NLS. Because if I write this, squared minus V5 squared plus V6 squared minus V7 squared, and I change the equal to zero, you can sum them up and you will get a resonance, but it's a resonance with support six. It's supported on six modes, so it's not interesting for the cubic NLS. Okay, so once you have this, let me see, can I, no, I have to, can I cancel this here because So with all this said, I can uh, prove uh, that I can produce a set S with only prescribed resonances occurring. So I can choose S such that US is invariant, only prescribed occur, maybe this one plus some others, and no other right angles occur? Well, the answer is yes, provided that, I have to write it here. So the answer to that question is here. Yes, if, no, two resonances, have at most one point in common. Okay? Because if two resonances have at most one point in common, when I sum them up, they give me a resonance of degree at least six. And in the cubic NLS, it's irrelevant. Okay? So, can you play the game the same kind of uh, game in uh, uh, the NLS of higher degree than one. Well, well, yes, but you have to be careful because, for instance, we have just seen that you cannot take two resonances of degree four. Because if you take two resonances of degree four and they, you sum them up, then you get resonance of degree 8. So if you are in the NLS of degree 8, this is unavoidable. This is still a resonance and you have to keep it. So you have to be a little bit of careful of what you ask. So, uh, but you could define maximal resonances. So you could say a maximal resonance is a resonance in which exactly 2p plus 2 distinct point appears. So this is a maximal resonance for degree 4 because I have 4 distinct point. I could give a maximal resonance of degree 6 with 6 existing point. And then I could ask if I could prescribe these resonances in the NLS of degree correspondingly the same. And that would be true. But otherwise you have to be careful.
So in general, what is the best that you can hope? Decide that you want to prescribe, which means you want some resonances to hold. So I prescribe some resonances. Mu 1 up to mu capital K. Uh, I used K. N. OK. And then what do I have to do? I have to compute. the span, so the linear vector field generated by the resonances over Q and intersect it with ZD. Because obviously, I am not interested in a resonance which is not an integer valued. But on the other hand, I have to consider in principle combinations in Q because it's still resonance. I mean, it, it's not obvious that this is equal to the uh, span of the mu i's over z. So just be careful. OK, and then the best I can ask is that only the resonances in this set hold. I call the d n is the number. Mu is in z n. I erased it. Mu is uh, exactly in the same space as the number of tangential sites. I'm sorry. Okay, and you can require this. So you can ask. So what is the point? You prescribe this certain number of frequencies of uh, resonances. Maybe you ask, yeah, I think I, I'm missing a hypothesis. I, I was writing this down yesterday, and uh, I think I missed an hypothesis. You need to require that these resonances have at most one point in common. Two, re two different resonances cannot have too many points in common. OK? And then you can prove that you can choose S so that these resonances are satisfied and none of the other resonances are satisfied. And moreover, US is invariant. But this is, in general, not a completely trivial proof. Okay? In the qubit case, it's quite obvious. You just do it by induction on the points, or how, uh, however you want. But if you want to do this proof in general, in any NLS, so you have to consider many more resonances. And uh, uh, you want to try to prove this. This is uh, not completely trivial. Okay? And in particular, we were interested in the following sub-problems. We wanted to prescribe a certain number of frequencies of the form of the rectangles, of uh, resonances of rectangle form. So we wanted to prescribe some resonances which represented rectangles. And we wanted to show that we could choose S in such a way that these were the only resonances to hold, plus their linear combinations, and then still US was invariant. And you can do it, but it's well, maybe 10 pages proof. So, and, uh, also, if you try to say you decide that you want to work on the quintic NLS and you want to prove a statement of this form, then it's uh, reasonable. The hard thing is always to give a general proof. So you don't want to give a proof that holds for some fixed number of degrees. You want to give a proof in for all degrees. Then you have to put up some structure. And let me say that in the quintic case, uh, well, actually, in both cases, this was proved by myself and Emanuele House. And uh, there is a nice explanation, I think, in the paper on the Quintic case, which shows why these things are true. But you can find the full proof uh, in the paper with uh, Emanuele and Marcel Guardia. It uh, gives the full proof of this fact. So why do I want this? Well, uh, why do I want this is because uh, if I prescribe a number of frequencies and, OK, accept their linear combinations, 
then uh, I can hope to be able to write explicitly, or at least semi-explicitly, what the resonant NLS Hamiltonian is when I have these resonances here. And then if I have an explicit expression, I can hope, again, to prove uh, that I have growth of Sobolev norms for the resonant system. By simply, so the idea is uh, produce this set where you have prescribed the resonances. The set is invariant for the Birkhoff dynamics, so restrict to this set. You have a finite dimensional set. This finite dimensional set is not integrable because, uh, in general, because it contains resonances, but maybe it's a little bit simpler than just studying the full uh, resonant NLS Hamiltonian. And maybe there I can apply all the techniques of finite dimensional systems that will allow me to construct uh, dis diffusive solutions. And that's exactly what one does. So, The, I think it's instructive to show the I teams construction. So what is your answer in the case P equal 1? Because, in fact, what you will need in general P cases, it's essentially the same, except you have a little bit less control on the resonances. So your set S, which, remember, it has to be a set such that US is invariant, is written as a union of generation sets. OK? The cardinality of SI, which they call N, is uh, related to the number of generations by this formula here. Okay, so I have capital N sets, each set containing a lot of points. Each SI is generic in the sense of generic sets, which I gave you before. So no, no right angles. OK? So this means in particular that if you put all the Fourier support on a single SI, this is an invariant subset on which I know completely the dynamics. OK? Then I need a further condition, which becomes extremely important in the P larger than 1 case. So I'm starting to write small. So I have to require that if I take that uj is equal, <laughs> let me write it down, for all j in si. So let me call this the generation manifold. So what I'm requiring is that I can take all the points in one single si and put them in phase, put them all equal. This is in uh, c and this is in c, but I'm asking that all the points are in phase in one single generation. So I want that this is invariant. And obviously for all i. Okay? This means, uh, for instance, that if you look at a single generic set, the orbits on the single generic set are not quasi-periodic orbits, but you get periodic orbits because you have a reduction of the degrees of freedom. But what I want is that this is invariant for the dynamics of the HRS, OK? And then I have uh, the property of being a generation set, which says that I prescribe a certain number of resonances, which was I was talking about before. So for all j in SI, there exists a spouse in SI. And there exist children in the next generation. And it has to be true that I have to write the correct order J, C1, S, and C2 
form a rectangle. Okay? J, child, J, one child, the spouse, the second child. Form a rectangle like this. And then I write it here. For all j in Si, oh, obviously here I have to require that i is smaller or equal than n minus 1, because I have capital N generations. I do not have children for the last generation. OK? And then this is the same. If I take that i is larger than 1, then for each j in the i-th generation, I have a brother of J. I am not becoming completely politically correct, but I don't know the word sibling, but it's S. So I, I needed. And also, I realized in that in our papers, we all used the, the Italian notation. So we had uh, figlio, and <laughs> so it was F. Fi. But <laughs> so I have a brother, and I have two parents. This is in Si, and then I have two parents, E2 of J. And again, J, one parent, the brother, and the second parent form a rectangle. And the notation, this is an ordered list, the notation is exactly the same. J, one parent, the brother, another parent. Okay. So you see, I'm prescribing quite a few frequencies. So you can think of this construction as being inductive. So you start to fix the first generation. I have to fix at least an even number of points. I, I think it's even, yes. Then I choose marriage bounds which means that I have to make these guys here produce children. And the children have to be produced in such a way that J and S are opposites on the rectangle. So here is a choice of children. OK. And then I have to take my children. I have to make them marry, so I have to make a coupling between uh, choose two points. In such a way, I did not write it, but you have to remember, if I want to be able to prescribe resonances, I do not want that two points appear in two different resonances. So I do not want, so these points appear as a couple in one resonance, so I cannot make brothers marry, which Sounds reasonable, but uh, apart from the obvious jokes, it's, uh, it comes from the fact that if I don't ask that, then uh, surely I cannot prescribe resonances in the way that I want, because I will get some extra points. OK, so I make my marriage bonds, which are circles, because remember, parents have to be opposite. And I draw the children. And apart from the fact that the picture becomes very messy if I try to go further from the third generation, it's quite clear that this is the mechanism that you have to take. The only point that is missing here is the fact that I just drew the points random. And instead, I have to draw integer points. But this is not really a problem, because you have to remember that if you have a resonance and you rescale it by any rational, by any factor. Uh, well, rational integer, the important thing is that you get an integer valued vector, then this is a still, still a resonance. So if I have circles, so if I want to have a sufficiently many po integer points on a circle, I just have to rescale it. Or if you want, first make this picture on Q and use the fact that Q is dense on these circles and then rescale. Okay? So it's not really a problem, the fact that you uh, only have integer points. 
But naturally, all this is very nice and what was the thing that I liked a lot. But if I do a picture like this, unfortunately, I do not have the growth of Sobolev norm condition. So I have to be a little bit smarter if I want to produce the growth of Sobolev norm condition. And so they imposed the norm explosion condition, which I will write down. So why want, I hope I'm not <laughs> getting the signs wrong. I think they put n minus 3, but I don't really understand why it's not n minus 1. j to the 2s, 3, j to the 2s. And this has to be large. So what I want is I want to choose my points in the generation set in such a way that the HS norm supported on the last generation set is much larger than the HS norm supported on the first generation set. And why am I saying this is the HS norm supported on the last generation set? Because I have the generational equality. So remember, on uh, the same generation, everything is in phase. So they're just fixed. And the only thing you really have to control is this. OK? Well, once you have this wonderful construction, the point, well, one point is that in the cubic case, uh, but I need, so I'll write it here. Obviously, I need uh, another condition, which I have to write. The resonances are the prescribed ones and no others. Otherwise, I mean, I would have absolutely no reason of, of, out of what I talked before for the first quarter of an hour. So then the point is uh, that I can write the Hamiltonian. With all these restrictions, I can write the resonant Hamiltonian explicitly. And uh, get it wrong, because I obviously will. It's here. So, well, this is the resonant Hamiltonian restricted to the invariant subspace. So obviously, you have to also divide it by the number of sites in one resonance, in one uh, uh, generation. Otherwise, it's not a symplectic change of variables. But so restricted to UG, it's. Sum over the BJs. I have this i, i going from 1 to n to the square, with a possible mistake in front of here. But the important thing is that I have this. In the fourth, I should not go i going from 1 to n. Then I have plus 4. The real part of bi squared, bi plus 1 bar squared, sum over i. This is the Hamiltonian. So it's very explicit and it's relatively nice. Also, I would like you to notice that Remember, the NLS and the uh, resonant Hamiltonian had the mass conservation, so we'll have a constant of motion, and this is a constant of motion for this dynamics. So in fact, this is completely irrelevant. Uh, that's why I wrote it this way. So uh, once you get to this nice picture, then you start studying this finite dimensional Hamiltonian. And what you get? So you get, so the first remark does not really depend on the Hamiltonian. Each generation is generic. So for each generation, if you put uh, 
bi equal to zero for all i different from some uh, fixed point i zero, say one, let me avoid too much notations, then you get one periodic orbit and it's unstable. Okay, this is completely generous. It's just because yes, I are a generic sets, so it must be true. Also, <laughs> since the only resonances which occur are the ones that I prescribe, if I decide to put uh, bi equal to zero for all i different from say one and two, then this is invariant. In fact, I could choose one and three, one and whatever, but the interesting is to put two consecutive uh, generations different from <coughs> zero. And so you have this picture. So let's, here I have various unstable periodic orbits going like this. And unstable means that I know they have a local unstable and stable manifold, all of them. Okay, so here I have outcoming ingoing, and I'm not going to draw more, okay? Now, if you restrict to this set, so I'm putting all these to zero, so these are not moving, and these two exist, then you see, but this here you have to do by a direct computation on the Hamiltonian, you shall see that in fact, so in this subspace, you have this outgoing, and it just reaches the incoming of this one here, and the outgoing of this one reaches the incoming of this one, okay? So they are connected by a heteroclinic in the two-dimensional subspace. And this is true for any couple of dimensions because if you look at your equations, your equations are completely translation invariants. Okay, I do not see in which generation I am, except for the first and the last, where maybe where I see some little difference. So the point is that once you have this nice picture here, you want to do a shadowing lemma. So you say, let's suppose that I start very close to this outgoing manifold, which means that I'm putting this periodic orbit has uh, some energy on it. All the others are very close to zero. And uh, not only I have some energy, but I know that I am uh, very close to this manifold on which I have uh, complete control. Then, uh, well, just because these are elliptic and they essentially don't move, and also there is very little interaction between, say, this generation and this generation here. So with all these control, I can say that essentially the only thing that this initial datum sees is the local dynamics given by these two things here. So I start here and I move and I get quite close to the second periodic orbit. Naturally there is some spreading, you start very very close and then you move further away a little bit. This is unavoidable. But then, if I am sufficiently near to this second periodic orbit, I can hope that the only thing that this system sees is the linear dynamics close to this periodic orbit. So it's a linear uh, uh, hyperbolic dynamics in uh, two, uh, just two dimensions, so one degree of freedom. And it's essentially true. And so you can see that you start close to this periodic orbit, you just go around the periodic orbit some time, and then you get go out, and you reach this point here. And this is essential standard linear theory, it's quite simple. And well then, keep going and start close enough, and you get your picture, okay? So you can prove I have it written in some really terrible notations. But so delta is e to the gamma n. I'm sorry, I, I just took them from the paper and didn't have time to think about it too much. Where gamma is very large. Oh, I guess there is a minus. Yes. Okay. 
And then I have a time which is of the order n logarithm of 1 over delta. So it's n squared, basically. n is my number of generations, remember. And then, so I start delta close to b1. It's probably not exactly delta. It's delta to some little power, but it's completely irrelevant. And reach delta close to, sorry, Bn, b1 equal 1, bj equals 0. And uh, reach delta close to Bn equal 1. And all the other Bi's equal 0. Okay, so start delta close to the first periodic solution and delta close to the last periodic solution. So once you have this construction, if I want to have a solution of uh, my resonance system which starts with very small HS norm, then I also have to do some mm, very big rescalings because now I use that I can rescale my equations and still get an equation. Okay, and this is a trivial fact. And at least I have proved the existence of uh, a solution which uh, uh, does what I wanted for the resonant case. Okay, and the time becomes much worse than this, really much worse, because I have to do a very large rescaling in order to ensure that the Sobolev norm at the beginning is small. Okay, now I have. Uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes? Uh, mm. Mm. Um, yeah, but... Yeah. Mm. So, at this point, so what... So, what is the basis of all these things? So, the basis of uh, this condition I explained, I think. You want this condition because in this way you start here and this orbit has a much smaller Sobolev norm than here, which is the end orbit. So this condition I have to keep. For any uh, uh, degree NLS I have to produce something like this. What I could do is I could try to not ask that the resonances are rectangles. So in principle, I have many more resonances that I, have, that I could impose. But so I could create a generation set, ask that each generation set is, each generation is generic, which means that I have these unstable periodic orbits. And then uh, uh, what is the conclusion of all the thing? I can at least try to make this picture, provided that I have the heteroclinic connections. Well, the fact that this manifold is invariant is again pretty trivial, because I'm just saying that no resonances occur except the ones that I wanted to. And the, the resonance that I want to occur are just between the i-th generation and the i-th plus one generation. So this is pretty easy to require. So what we thought at the beginning of this problem is, OK, let's concentrate on this question here. Can we produce uh, a, a, a two sets, S1 and S2, in such a way that you have two periodic orbits and the periodic orbits are connected? Well, it turned out that it, it was not so simple. So we started, well, obviously, you, you start simple. So instead of trying to produce two sets, with a large number of points in each set, we started to say, OK, let's see what happens if uh, I take, let's say, so I start really, really simple. I take one rectangle relation, and I plug it in the NLS of degree 6. Is it true that this has heteroclinic connections? Oh, well, yes, it's true. So we were pretty happy. And uh, essentially, once we understood this, we said, OK, then maybe we, we can do the paper on the NLS of degree uh, 5. The only problem was that when you go and compute, so we started 
with the generation sets, and we arrived here. But obviously, as I told you, uh, you cannot just prescribe rectangle relations. If I have two rectangle relations like this, and I sum them up, then I get a relation of degree 6. And the relation of degree 6 is not negligible in the NLS of degree 5. So what turned out is that we had a more complicated Hamiltonian here. But in fact, it was not really a problem. And uh, you can, I mean, it, it takes a while to prove that you can do it in such a way that the resonances you choose are the only resonances that exist and no other exist. But then you can run through this argument in a pretty uh, similar way to the case of the cubic. So this seemed nice, but we asked ourselves, OK, but maybe we can try to put a resonance of order 6 inside just one single resonance made out of, uh, which is not a rectangle. So the simplest example of a resonance which is not a rectangle is if you choose S to be this set here, 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2. And that, no, you take 1 minus minus 1 plus, help, 1 minus minus 1 minus 2. Wait, uh, I got the wrong signs. Well, it's exactly the same. Minus 2, which means plus minus 2, minus this is 0. And if you play the same games with the squares, this is 0. So this is a resonance of order 6. The resonance is j is 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, minus 2, 2. This I have wrote in z, but you can put it in z too. I explained this in the first lecture. OK? So what happens? if I study the resonant Hamiltonian restricted to this set? Well, it turns out that it is, uh, uh, this resonant Hamiltonian is uh, uh, invariant. So this set is invariant for the resonant Hamiltonian. So I can really study it. The uh, Hamiltonian restricted to this set is integrable but non-trivial in the sense that it might have separatrices or heteroclinic connection joining the two periodic orbits, which I know exist. But the picture is like this. So to make a picture, I have, uh, so I, I'll make a picture on this cylinder, even though it's uh, really incorrect. So I have my first periodic orbit, I have my second periodic orbit, and then instead of having a connection going from here to here, I have, uh, so say that this is uh, spa my phase space, I have uh, some other periodic orbits going like this. Then I have uh, a separatrix going around this cylinder. And I have uh, a stable fixed point on the other side. And then I have other periodic orbits going to here, which means, uh, uh, sorry, there. Which means that in fact these are not unstable, and uh, I cannot go from this periodic orbit to this periodic orbit because I have a topological. Ob uh, what do you say? Abstraction. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <coughs> So it just doesn't work. I mean, I, I made the picture in a totally incorrect un way. If you take the uh, subspace restricted to two generation, I in fact, uh, it's a three sphere. So uh, I'm sorry for this picture. I made some brutal symplectic reductions and just tried to make a picture that was decent. OK. So well, <sighs> this is a fact. And uh, there's nothing we could do about it. So we started to think, OK, so what happens if you plug, uh, so if, if this is uh, maybe a, a bad resonance because I'm taking four points, and uh, there are the points 1 and minus 1, which appear with multiplicity 2 in my resonance relation. Could I try to make a resonance with six distinct points? You do, you compute. 
And I'm, I'm not going to even try to make the picture in these variables because I'm absolutely unable to do it. But you get a rather complicated picture of the face portrait and still you have an obstacle. You cannot go from one periodic orbit to the second periodic orbit. It's, it's explicit computation, so there's nothing that you can say about it. So, well, then we said, OK, let's try to understand this problem. And <coughs> <coughs> oops, we made many simulations. And uh, essentially, nothing worked. Also, we have this very depressing fact that if you take one single rectangle resonance, so it's suppose that S is made of these four points here, and plug it in the resonant dynamics of the NLS of degree, I think, higher than nine, than 10. Has to be, okay? So just plug it in some NLS of higher and higher degree and compute the dynamics on this set here. Instead of getting this wonderful picture where you have the two periodic orbits joined by a heteroclinic, you start getting obstructions. So it seemed that even if we tried to use rectangles, which are the simplest possible resonances, we could not go to a degree of higher than 10, <coughs> which seemed to be a catastrophe. But what we hadn't realized is that our ansatz was not correct. We are not really asking that the periodic orbit made, that the two periodic orbit made of this picture here has heteroclinic connections. What I want is that I have a generation set with uh, lots of points and each couple of points has a rectangle. So this is my first generation and this is my second generation. First, 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 second, 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 second. And I go on. <coughs> okay. What we need is that if we make sufficiently many rectangles, then I have this picture here. With the number of points in one generation being n very large. So this turned out to be the correct approach to take because uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, I because this is the Hamiltonian that you get. So So I have my first generation made out of n points, my second generation again made out of n points, and uh, I have a rectangle for each couple of points and no other rectangle, no other resonance relations for these points. This is possible. Okay, and then I take that that the intragenerational equality. So I take that uj is equal to b1 if j is in s1 and uj is equal to b2 if j is in s2. And I show that this is an invariant subspace. Again, this is quite simple. And then I try to compute the Hamiltonian and you get this. P plus one. So I, I'm writing down some rather nasty numbers, which are obviously completely irrelevant. But since I had them, I'd write them down. P plus one. So this is the first piece of the Hamiltonian. It's a very high degree in n. Remember that n is a large number. But this is a constant of motion, because this is the L2 norm for the two-dimensional system. And then. numbers I hope it fits P 
minus 1. And then here, I get the Hamiltonian of the cubic case. E1 fourth minus E2 fourth plus 4 real part of B1, B2. This compare with the Hamiltonian that I wrote there with just two generations. This piece here is exactly the uh, NLS, it's the cubic NLS Hamiltonian, restricted to two generations. And then I have a correction, but this correction is at least NP minus 1 of degree NP minus 2. And also I, I have some control on what it looks like. But the important thing is that if you take n large enough, the dominant term is this, but this is irrelevant because it's a concept of motion. So the dominant term is the cubic NLS times a high power of a constant of motion. Well, if you, write, if you draw the face portrait of this integrable Hamiltonian, you will see that if n is large enough, you must necessarily get this picture here. And then essentially I'm done because once I have this kind of game here, so I, I prove to you because this is a very low dimensional system that if this has a, a heteroclinic connection, then this correction should be negligible. And once I have this, then I am essentially in business because at this point I just have to do my shadowing lemma. And shadowing lemmas are much more robust things. So I really, what, what kind of arguments did I use? I used the fact that when I move here, all the things in far away periodic orbits are essentially fixed and that they have an elliptic behavior. And in fact, this turns out to be true also in the general case. So the whole point was to understand this. So naturally, you can still be curious and ask yourself, OK, can I maybe take n copies of uh, this relation here and try to see if a similar result works. And the answer is it fails. If you try to take n copies of a relationship like this or any relation of degree 6 and uh, try to play the same game as a limiting factor, you will get this piece here plus a small correction because this comes from uh, uh, order four res rectangle resonances. And naturally, this is an integrable Hamiltonian with, with the B1 and B2 mod square as constants of motion. And so nothing moves. You obviously cannot have heteroclinic connections. And this is why you really have to use rectangles. So at this point, I'll just uh, make some final comments. So maybe. I'll cancel. Ah, but I have a whole last blackboard to use, which I had completely forgotten about. So, points. The first point is uh, what happens when I change the dimension in this algorithm. It seems, in, in your, my whole construction, I essentially only use combinatorics. So, I could increase the dimension without no particular problem. But in fact, this is not interesting because naturally, if I increase the dimension, I can just say I have a two-dimensional solution inside T3. So this is not particularly interesting to point. The unfortunate thing, which uh, however I have to point out, is that I am not able to decrease the dimension. Because you see, well, no, you don't see because I put it here. In principle, I could produce resonances of order 5 even in uh, Z1. So even if I was working on, say, a quintic NLS on a circle, because this is a resonance, so I do not only have trivial resonances. But unfortunately, I cannot get a toy model Hamiltonian unless I play with rectangles. And clearly, rectangles uh, only are degenerate in dimension 1. So, unfortunately, there's no result for T. And uh, this is a fact. 
what we can do and what has been done, in fact, by Gerbert uh, and Thoman is uh, to show that there are solutions which exchange a little bit of Sobolev norms already on T. But I cannot, one cannot produce the cascade. Uh, it's a very two-dimensional question. Also, another unfortunate but true thing is that while, uh, while I was doing the periodic solutions, the quasi-periodic solutions, I did not really point it out, but most of the construction I did worked for any dispersive equation. So I just need a little bit of dispersion to play with my resonance sets, but then I could produce more or less similar theorems as uh, the ones that I gave for the quasi-periodic solutions. The hard part is maybe then to do the KM theorem. But, uh, and in fact, there is a result by Wai-Ming Wang on the wave equation using some kind of really similar uh, kind of uh, solution. Obviously, the wave equation in dimension higher than one, you need dispersion, okay? But here, I, I would not know how to play this game uh, if uh, I change the equation. But I think it's an interesting problem, so say, uh, can I do a similar game on the wave equation? The equation. So I think mm, people tried, but I don't think there's been any success in this direction. And the problem is uh, that you really are using uh, some uh, explicit properties of the resonance sets of the NLS Hamiltonian, so you cannot change. What I think that could be interesting is to see if you can do this increasing the dimension. And, uh, because if you increase the dimension, resonances should be simpler to understand. So it seems to me that is a, a hopeful point of view. So another thing that we're doing, and then I close, uh, is uh, I, I think quite interesting, but uh, we're not completely sure of success that, that, that we have the result is uh, what if we take the cubic NLS and we try to understand uh, uh, the existence of, uh, of uh, solutions which drift not really close to zero, but close to a one-dimensional solution. So this is similar to what Zaharhani did uh, for the uh, plane wave solution. And it's quite interesting to try to see if you can do it for more complicated but one-dimensional solutions. And it seems it might work. And it's a reasonable question. And the last question, which I leave you with, with I think is totally open, but still, I think, very interesting, is uh, um, can you change the compact domain on which you're working. So could I do it on S3? Could I do this game on uh, some uh, compactly group? And unfortunately, the answer is I don't know, but I think it's a really good question. And there you have uh, quite a lot of control on the resonance sets, but you would need to get a little bit serious about the harmonic analysis and, and try to really understand what these sets look like. So thank you. Uh, in the cubic case, wh why is it difficult to know what happens after time capital T? So why is it difficult? Well, from here you get no knowledge because at that point P becomes too big. Okay. And could I make other techniques to try to know for longer times? I really don't know. What you could try to see is, could I control the longer and longer chains? But I think that still you, you get uh, worse and worse results. So the, the point is, I, I am not really good at these things, but the point is that you really cannot go to the limit. So you cannot construct a solution which goes to infinity. It's simply not within these computations. You would be able to do it if you were able to take this picture here and the proof that a picture of this type exists for the true NLS. 
you know that the periodic solutions persist for the true NLS, but you don't know. You know also these local things, but you don't know that they, they, they match. And then in that case, you could do an infinite shadow, but otherwise. Um, other questions, comments? Uh, yes. So, so here I understand if you take a small n large enough, you somehow reduce to. <laughs> so, but where is the analog of the capital N? You, you need then to. The, the number of uh, naturally. This is just the two generation case. Then I have to do this with yeah, okay. capital N generations. But the point is that once I am able to do this. Right. In fact, in n generations, I will just get exactly that Hamiltonian there, plus a small correction, except that it will be more and more generations. The size of the S1 does not matter. Uh, here, in this case, the size of the original this. thing does not matter. You can take S1 and two, only two people. No, no. each SI has, uh, uh, they, they have to be always the same number of, uh, oh, because you see, one of my points was that I needed... So the, the, the small n does not matter in this case. The, the choice of the small n. The choice of the small n, if I want to do the norm explosion, it has to be 2n. To to, uh, to, no, exactly. Oh, okay, okay. At least that's... Oh, okay, okay. The point is that here, oh, okay, okay. every time I try to perturb this, this scheme and the fact that you can construct the generation sets in such a way that to, and to have this and, uh, and still maintain all the condition. This is the I-team's construction. And every time I try to per perturb it, say add a couple of more points, it seems that it does not help in any way, and actually it hinders your proof. So it's, rigid. So it's quite rigid. Yes, it's quite rigid from the beginning. Yes. You look at the defocusing case. What happens in the focusing? Exactly the same, yes, because you're really very close to zero. And uh, so you do not see any effect. It's just that maybe it's... Uh, Change slightly the computation? Something. No. Well, OK, yes, because at some point you will have a minus. But you see, yeah. all I discussed was the homogeneous piece of degree 2p plus 2, so I lose the sign. I, I have to be a little bit more careful in all my approximation arguments, but still, since I'm very close to 0, I it works. Just that maybe the solution that I have produced has exploded for some reason before. I, I, I don't know. And, uh, no, I think not, right? It's not possible. It's so uh, everything close to zero. So no, no. Uh, uh, um, in fact, this was pointed to me by the uh, referee in the paper, and we corrected it in the paper because we hadn't thought about it. But it's as absolutely the same. Okay. Uh, other questions? Or If not, let's thank uh, Professor Thank you. Thank you.